any other questions uh, bef before we start getting into what we have to get into for today? Yes, I have a question. Okay. Um, so let's say you do them different, like multiple times. Does it keep your highest score out of all of them? It does keep your highest score. Okay. Yeah, so I want you to keep doing them. Some people think, oh, I did it and I got an okay score and I want to keep my score. No. If you, if you do worse the second time, it's going to keep the highest score. All right. So, yes, please do all your chances um, so that you ultimately, you should be able to see the correct answers anyway after the first try. Um, and I noticed on another one, people were putting the right word down. I forget which one it was, but it was marking it wrong, even though it was exactly what the computer thought the right answer was. So I really don't know what was going on with that one. So I curved that. I'm going to curve that one back for everybody as well. I got to go back and look at my notes to see which one that was. All right. So let me share. Oh, Mr. Russell, I had a question also. Oh, go ahead. Um, so are the practicals and the physiology tests, are they going to be open for 24 hours? Or are they going to be open like when we start class or how does it work? Okay. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do, technically we have to have it done by the end of the day for that lab. But since we meet twice a week, so let's say, let's say our first practical was supposed to be today. And our first physiology test was supposed to be today. What we're going to do is come in. I think some of those labs, we have to cover a lab, like for the next bit of material. And so during a face-to-face -face lab, what we would normally do is come in first, take the test, and then we would cover the next lab. But obviously we can't do that. So what I'm going to do is on the days that we have a practical and we're supposed to cover the next lab on the same day, we're just going to come in. We're going to cover the material for the lab we're supposed to do that day. And then maybe if you have any questions about, you know, the, the test you're going to take for that day, we'll field questions on that. And then I'm going to make the assignment due the following day since our next class won't be until say Wednesday. So if you had a practical today, I would make it due tomorrow before our next class. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, you, you should have, you know, from the day I open it through the following day to complete both the practical and the physiology test. So the, the practicals are going to come from all the pictures, all that practice work that you're doing. Um, the physiology test, I write all my own. I'm not using the department one. Um, and it comes from uh, obviously, the stuff I talk about while we're in class, and I'm, I'm going to direct you to the pages in the Engage Lab Manual that has the physiology in it as well, and that's where I pull my questions from. What I say during our Zoom meeting, uh, sometimes it's from my own chapter in my book, which I also have to describe to some people because they don't know what the model book is. I got a, a couple of emails on that, and then from the Engage Manual. All right. Okay, so, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Let me... I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, I didn't see it. Like, can you open the um, Engage things? Because it won't let us review our answers for the Engage, the one where we have to go into Wiley. It won't let us review any of the answers that we had after it's done with. All right, let me make a note of that, Smider. So, because when I set the parameters on it, I set it to so that you could view the right answers and everything. Maybe I didn't click the submit button. Yeah, because it says not permitted. All right, I'll 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 fix it. Let me uh, let me make a note of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you for letting me know that. So I'll fix that after we get out of class today. I'm pretty sure I set that. I don't know why it, it wouldn't be doing it. All right, so let me share my screen here. <clears throat> All right, so uh, if a couple of people here for the first time today, when you log into our, our website, our Canvas site, everything's in this modules page. You need to go through everything in the start here module if you haven't done that as of yet. 
and I need everybody to complete this student contract. I don't want you to wait till this 14th, June 14th. I need it. I want it done today. So make sure you get that done. If you haven't downloaded Respondus, please do that and try and get this done, this verification uh, assignment done. That'll let me know that it works on your computer. So go through all of that immediately if you haven't done that as of yet. Now, I posted the appendix that has the answers to the figures uh, in the exercises, but this appendix goes to the manual that I wrote. So like the first link under virtual resources is where I'm putting what I call the models book, which is not published anymore, but I made it available for y'all. This is what we covered last week on Wednesday, the endocrine system. This week is the, is the heart. The cardiovascular system actually has three chapters in it. So let me just pull this up real quick. So, so this appendix right here has the answers to the worksheets that are in the models book. So if you pull that up, notice that in my book, it starts with the blood, but we don't start with the blood in the cardiovascular system with the way that the new uh, lab is set up. We actually do this as on the second practical. So you would have to scroll down because I put all the cardiovascular system in one chapter. You have to scroll past all the blood and then you get to the heart. So this is what I mean by the models book. I took pictures of all the models, well, most of them, and I made it like a workbook. So you can go and label the models at home. So you should pull this up and work on it and uh, see if you can pull up some, some pictures to try and, and label it without looking up the answers right away. But you can if you want. So the answers to all of these are in that appendix and it follows this figure number. So in the appendix, you would have to, you know, scroll down until you get to figure 9.1 to identify the structures on the anterior side of the heart. Same thing with the posterior side of the heart, same thing with the frontal section, so forth and so on. So this is what I call the models book. All right. So that's what the appendix goes to. It, the appendix does not go to these write-ins or these post assignments. These were generated by all the faculty in the department, not necessarily just from my book. All right, so I hope that's kind of clear. Um, Uh-oh, let me see. What class am I in? I thought I posted that. Maybe I didn't post it. I might have posted it in the wrong class. All right, well, I'll get to that in a minute. All right, so let's go um, to the Engage website. All right, can y'all still see my screen since I switched to the Engage websites? Yes. All right, so y'all see the Engage website and not the, the Canvas course? Yes. Okay, very good. All right, so <clears throat> let me pull up the heart. Also, if you haven't purchased the code for this engage manual yet, you have to click this here button because come Wednesday, we're covering exercise three. Well, you only have the first two exercises in the engage manual for free. So you have to purchase the code by clicking this button if you haven't done that yet, because you won't be able to open up this exercise three or anything after it. All right. So I'm going to pull up exercise two with, uh, the chapter. And normally what I do is I'll go through and sometimes I just teach from the text that's in this chapter. Um, sometimes I just tell you where I want you to go and review the material. So this is where your physiology information, some of your physiology information comes from, from these engaged chapters like this. So I put together a little PowerPoint this morning from the pictures that come from the textbook to cover the material that's in the chapter, like the heart wall, um, the circulatory routes and where the blood moves. I put in order pictures like this in a PowerPoint. And that's what I was just looking at. I thought I'd put it in our class. It must be in the other one, but I'll upload it after we're done. I'm going to show, I'm going to lecture from it in a minute. Um, so you need to review all of this material in the chapter if you haven't done that yet. That's why it's vitally important that you either have a hard copy of the book or you buy the code 
because you're gonna have to be reviewing all the material in here, all right? So the, the physiology portion in the engage manual is not very long. It stops after cardiac output and regulation of the heart. So when you get to here, where it says gross cardiac anatomy, that's where the physiology stops. So you're covering all the way down the chapter until you get to here for the physiology portion of the test. All right. All right. So let me, I got to stop sharing this one. How do you, oh, stop share. What I want to do right now is pull up the PowerPoint I put together to go over the physiology. So what we're gonna do each lab, if you weren't here, we're gonna cover the physiology. I'll field questions that you might have if there's any problems or whatnot. And then the second part of the class is really like a study lab. You're gonna be working on your exercises. Um, technically, the exercises assignments for that exercise have to be completed the same day we have lab. All right, so some if you haven't done them yet, your first exercise assignments on the endocrine system should be completed and the exercise two assignments on the heart need to be completed by tonight. That way you can start working on exercise three material before we come to lab on Wednesday. All right, so let me reshare my screen. All right, can y'all see the PowerPoint now? Yes. All right, very good. All right, now, so all I did was go into my lecture PowerPoint and just pull out pictures that co co uh, correspond to the sections in the engage manual for the material that we're supposed to cover uh, with the physiology of the heart. So that's what I wanna spend a little bit of time on um, covering this. And then once we're done with that, it should, should take me about an hour to go through this slide uh, the PowerPoint, maybe a little longer. And if you have questions, you need to just unmute yourself and holler at me because I'm not looking over to the right to see, like some people put a little hand up or something like that. I'm Typically, I'm looking directly ahead. So if you need to say something, just unmute, um, especially if I'm covering something and I go to move on and you don't have it yet. All right. Also, uh, make sure you have a notebook handy so you can write down notes and all of that. So does anybody have any questions before we start? And I'll take the silence from now on, meaning that no one has a question. <laughs> All right, so once we're done, if you do have your exercise two assignments already completed, which a lot of people do, you're more than welcome to leave the meeting, you know, go work on the other assignments if you want or review the ones you have, um, or you're more than welcome to stay in the meeting and work on any assignment that you want. All right. All right. So uh, the first slide I have here basically just shows where the heart's located in the body, which might sound silly. Everybody knows your heart's in your chest, but it has a name. The specific location of the heart is just deep to the sternum and just anterior to the vertebral column in the thoracic cavity. And that area, which obviously is between the right and left lung, has a name. The anatomical name for this part of the body where the heart's located is called the mediastinum. So this is where the heart's located. Obviously the sternum has been removed and the ribs have been removed off this picture. And we can see how the heart is placed anatomically in the mediastinum. The next thing that's in the engage manual that we have to cover are the parts of a heart wall. So there's different layers of the heart wall and we have to cover the layers of what's called the pericardium. The pericardium is the sac that surrounds the heart and it really does two things. Part of it anchors the heart in the mediastinum and it prevents the heart from overstretching because there's a part of that that's a membrane that is non-elastic. And then there's a part of the membrane that actually secretes a fluid, a lubricating fluid. And that's what I'm gonna go over right now with you. So if we look at this picture right here, obviously you can see the heart has been cut open. This is called a frontal section, by the way. On this side right here, this is all the right side of the heart. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. This is all the left side of the heart. 
which might seem kind of strange to you since this is the right side of your body if you're looking at it and this is the left side. That's because we're looking at an anterior view frontal section. And I'll show you a picture of that to help you out with that in a minute. Now, if we look at in detail, this the cutout section in this box down here, you can see the layers from the outside of the heart into the heart. And that's what we need to go over. So the very outside of the heart is surrounded by a membrane. The membrane is called the pericardium. The pericardium has an outermost layer. It's made of collagen fibers, which are non-elastic, and it's called the fibrous pericardium. So this fibrous layer is the layer that anchors the heart in place. It's non-elastic, it doesn't stretch. However, just on the inside of all of those fibers is, and it's not really blue in there, but the artist colored it in blue. You see these two little blue lines, one over here and one over here. The one that is just deep to the fibrous pericardium is called the parietal, vis, the parietal serous pericardium. So this, a serous pericardium, sorry about that. The serous pericardium is made up of two layers. It's a doubled membrane. The layer that is farther away from the heart is called the parietal layer. The layer that is closest to the heart is called the visceral layer. So there are several organs in our body that are surrounded by a doubled membrane system. The part of the membrane that is closest to the organ is just always called visceral, the visceral layer. The layer that is farthest away from the organ is always called parietal. So the serous pericardium is called the serous pericardium because it secretes a slippery fluid. It's called generically a serous fluid. Now specifically the serous fluid around the heart is called pericardial fluid. There's other serous fluids in the body. There's some around your stomach and your intestine. It's called the peritoneal fluid. There's some fluid around your lungs, a serous fluid. It's called the pleural fluid. So serous is just a generic name. The two layers of the serous membrane are nothing more than a simple squamous epithelial sheet. Simple squamous cells, you learn to name P1. So there's a simple squamous sheet right here. The outermost one is called the parietal serous pericardium. Then there's a little bitty cavity that's called the pericardial cavity. And then the next membrane adheres to the surface of the heart itself. That next blue line that you see is called the visceral serous pericardium. Now both of these membranes are simple squamous sheets. Both of those simple squamous sheets produce pericardial fluid and secrete it into this cavity. And that's what lubricates the heart as it is beating inside of the pericardium, the sac. Now, the visceral serous pericardium right here has another name. It's actually called what this number one is up here, epicardium, because there's three layers to the heart wall directly. If you remember epidermis in AMP1 is the most superficial layer of our, our skin. You remember epidermis, I'm sure. So epi means above. So the outermost layer of the heart wall itself just so happens to be this visceral serous pericardium. So we call it the visceral serous pericardium or the epicardium. That's why there's two names for that. Now, just deep to the epicardium, is the thickest part of the heart wall. That's where all the cardiac muscle is located. That's called the myocardium. So obviously those are the muscle cells that will contract in order to help move blood through the body. The innermost layer of the heart wall in here is called the endocardium. So those are the three layers of the heart wall directly. And then you need to know the names of the parts of the layers of the serous pericardium and then the fibrous pericardium. All right, so let's look at some of the structures of the heart. 
So here's a frontal section of the heart, obviously a, a graphic, and then here's a real heart over here that's been dissected. So I need to tell you, I need to use some of these names. So it's not my goal to go through and name every single thing and have you be able to identify it right now. However, some of you should be able to identify a lot of this stuff since you did some of your assignments already. So first of all, if you look at the heart, the artist kind of colored in one side blue and one side red. This side that is colored in blue, which is all of the right side of the heart, is only receives and then pumps out deoxygenated blood. So that's why it's all blue. The right side of the heart only receives and then pump out deoxygenated blood. And we're gonna go through the blood flow route in a second. The left side of the heart over here is colored red because it only receives and then pumps out oxygenated blood. So all mam mammalian hearts have four chambers. So we're a mammal, we have four, a four chambered heart. There are two upper atria. Here's the right atrium on this side. This is the left atrium on this side. And we have two lower ventricle chambers. The right ventricle over here, the left ventricle over here. Now, the atria are referred to as receiving chambers because they receive blood from somewhere. So in other words, we're about to learn the three sources that supply blood into the right atrium. So blood's gonna come into the right atrium. It then will go past a valve. There's four valves in the heart that ensure that blood only flows in one direction. So the blood's gonna go from the right atrium down to the right ventricle. The ventricles are referred to as the pumping chambers because the ventricles have the job of ejecting blood out of the heart into an artery. So the right ventricle has the job of pumping blood to the lungs, which the lungs are missing, but the left lung would be over here, the right lung would be over here. So the right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs and then back to the heart, to the right at uh, left atrium. So for that reason, since the right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs and then the lungs oxygenate the blood, that oxygenated blood then will return to the left atrium. For that reason, the right ventricle is called the pulmonary pump because it pumps blood to the pulmonary circuit and then back to the heart. Now that oxygenated blood is gonna return back to the left atrium from the lungs. That oxygenated blood is gonna go from the left atrium down to the left ventricle. The left ventricle then ejects that oxygenated blood into the largest artery of the body, the aorta, which actually has three parts to it. But from the left ventricle, that oxygenated blood goes to the aorta and then to, out to all parts of the body. So since the left ventricle is pumping oxygenated blood to the body everywhere, and then ultimately back to the right atrium, the left ventricle is called the systemic pump because it pumps the blood to the systems of the body and then back to the heart. All right, so my goal here is to go over the blood flow routes, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. You have to know where the blood's coming from and where it's going to. There are four valves in the heart. Two of the four valves separate the atria from their lower ventricle. And the valve that separates an atrium from a ventricle is called an atrioventricular valve. That's a generic name, atrioventricular. It's called that because it separates, the valve separates the atrium from the ventricle, atrioventricular. So that or you can abbreviate it AV valve. So the AV valve on the right side of the heart that separates the right atrium from the right ventricle is called the tricuspid valve, tricuspid. 
the valve, the AV valve on the left side of the heart that separates the left atrium from the left ventricle is called the bicuspid valve, or they still use the older term in a cath lab, mitral valve. You can probably barely see that name right there. The mitral valve or the bicuspid valve. Oh, and just to point out, one of the mistakes on, I think it was the post anatomy quiz, uh, was point, one of the pointers was pointing to these strings that you see right here. And they had it mislabeled as the right answer, so I fixed it. These little strings that attach the end of a valve or a flap of the valve, which is called a cusp. The flaps on the valve is called a cusp. Those little strings are called the chordae tendini. Chordae tendini. And so the only valves in the heart that have chordae tendini are the AV valves, the tricuspid on the right, the bicuspid on the left. Now you, you won't confuse those valves if you just say this. I, had, I said this when I was in your place. Try right by left. That's what I always said. Kind of like a little jingle there. So the tricuspids on the right, the bicuspids on the left. Try right by left. All right, so let's go over the circulation in the two main routes of the body. Before I do that though, I should tell you, uh, I'm not gonna wait until Wednesday since the blood vessels are on Wednesday, I usually define it now. How do we know what is an artery in the body and how do we know what is a vein? You know, we can't just say, oh, veins are blue and arteries are red because the only vessels in the body that are blue are the vessels that are colored blue. They're not really blue in your body. Um, the only vessels that are colored blue in graphics are the vessels that are transporting deoxygenated blood. And the vessels that are colored red in a graphic or picture are the vessels that carry oxygenated blood. Now the colorations of the vessels are reversed from the pulmonary circuit to the systemic circuit. That's going to become more relevant when you cover the blood vessels on Wednesday, so you don't get them wrong. But I'll just tell you, we know what the veins are relative to the arteries because of this. Veins, excuse me, veins are vessels in the body that are defined as a vessel that transports blood back to the heart. So all vessels that transport blood to the heart are called a vein or are called veins. All vessels in the body that transport blood away from the heart are called arteries. So for instance, this what's labeled number three right here. I'm going to tell you what it is in a second. It's colored blue. Same thing with this over here is colored blue. Well, these are arteries. These are not veins. But look over here. Number 10 down up here and this right here, those are blue, but these are veins. So we have to know which direction the blood is moving in in order to know what is a vein and what is an artery. Um, at least dealing with the heart and the pulmonary circuit and then the systemic circuit. And we're gonna cover more of that on Wednesday when we do the blood vessels. So let's go over this circulation. So I like to use this graphic over here. This is the same graphic that's in the engage manual as well. So you can also review that there when you're reading it. And I always like to start down here at number 10. I don't like to start at number one because I'm just an oddball, right? So um, what you see at the top, obviously the lungs, and what you see at the bottom, this little weird looking vessels down here, these represent capillary beds in the body. So the capillary bed down here represents all of the capillary beds and all the tissues and organs in the body all over the place in your stomach, your intestines, in your muscles, um, even in your heart itself, uh, all over the place. And then these capillaries up here obviously represent the capillaries in the lungs, which are called the pulmonary capillaries. So we have what's called the pulmonary circuit and a systemic circuit. So let's start at number 10. First of all, a capillary bed has what is called an arterial feed. A little bitty artery supplies oxygenated nutrient-rich blood into the capillary bed. That's why one of 
half of the capillary bed is colored red, and then the other half is kind of colored blue. As the fresh blood comes in, all the cells that are around the capillary bed take the oxygen out they need, they take all the nutrients out they need to live, and then they start dumping in their waste products. All cells in the body except mature red blood cells produce CO2 as a waste gas. So all that CO2 they're making is being dumped back into the capillary bed. Oxygen's being removed, nutrients being removed. CO2 is being dumped in, waste products being dumped in. So by the time the blood leaves the capillary bed, where it's colored blue, this is called deoxygenated blood because the cells took oxygen out of it. I will say though, at rest, while you're either lying down or sitting down, what we call deoxygenated blood coming out of a capillary bed right here is still saturated with oxygen up to 75%. We're gonna cover that in the respiratory system. So there's still some oxygen in there. But nonetheless, after it passes through the tissue, we call it deoxygenated. Which brings me to number 10. The deoxygenated blood that leaves the capillary beds leaves via very small veins called venules. All of the venules start to merge together as they're returning blood back towards the heart until all the veins merge to form the largest veins in the body. The largest veins in the body are the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. And then the largest vein on the heart itself is called the coronary sinus. So look at the heart picture over here for a second. This vessel right here is called the superior vena cava. This vessel down here is called the inferior vena cava. Notice in number 10, it shows the blood moving from these vessels up to the right atrium. So the right atrium actually has three sources of blood that it receives blood from. The superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. So if you look at the picture, you see the superior vena cava has the job of draining deoxygenated blood from all of the structures that lie above the heart. That would be your upper chest, your arms, your head. All that deoxygenated blood drains down through the superior vena cava into the right atrium. The inferior vena cava drains deoxygenated blood from all of the structures that lie below the heart back up to the right atrium. And then from the heart itself, which is not labeled here, is the coronary sinus. Um, I'll show you on the next picture where that's at. So all of the deoxygenated blood from the heart itself returns to the posterior part of the heart where the coronary sinus is located and then drains into the right atrium. So for that reason, the right atrium only receives blood that has been used up by all the cells in the body already, deoxygenated blood, goes to the right atrium. So that deoxygenated blood is going to go from the right atrium through the right AV valve called the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. The right ventricle is called the pulmonary pump because it pumps blood to the lungs and back. So where does it go? Well, it has to go through another valve. The blood's going to go from the right ventricle through a valve that separates the right ventricle from its artery. So the artery that receives blood from the right ventricle is called the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary trunk. And the valve that separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk is called the pulmonary semilunar valve. That's what this valve is right here. So there's a valve that separates the ventricles from their openings. The opening from the atria to a ventricle is the AV valve. The opening from a ventricle to its artery is always called a semilunar valve. Um, a semilunar valve. The semilunar valve that separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk is called the pulmonary semilunar valve. So the right ventricle pumps blood up into the pulmonary trunk, which courses posteriorly and divides into a left and a right pulmonary artery. The pulmonary arteries go to your lung. The left one goes to the left lung. The right one goes to the right lung. You breathe in and out. Your, your CO2 is removed from the, from the blood. Your oxygen is loaded back up into the blood. 
that oxygenated blood is going to return back from the lungs to the left atrium via four pulmonary veins. Two left pulmonary veins over here from the left lung and two right pulmonary veins over here from the right lung. Now notice the pulmonary veins are red. They're red because they're transporting oxygenated blood back to the heart from the lungs. So the left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the lungs via the pulmonary veins. That oxygenated blood is gonna go from the left atrium through the left AV valve called the bicuspid or mitral valve down to the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, the blood is gonna go through another semilunar valve right there. That semilunar valve separates the aorta from the left ventricle. And we call that the aortic semilunar valve. So notice the atria have a valve that blocks off either end of its openings. An AV valve blocks off the opening from an atrium and the semilunar valves block off the opening to their artery. So the artery for the left ventricle is the aorta. So the aorta will always receive blood from the left ventricle when the left ventricle contracts to eject blood out. The pulmonary trunk is the artery for the right ventricle. So whenever the right ventricle contracts to try and eject blood out, the pulmonary trunk will receive that deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle. So the left ventricle ejects blood through the aortic semilunar valve into the first part of the aorta. The first part of the aorta is called the ascending aorta because it goes up a little bit, just a little bitty stretch. It's called the ascending aorta. It then arches over. Lo and behold, the arch is called the aortic arch. <laughs> Go figure, it arches. So then the artery also courses posteriorly to the heart. So you see how the artist sends it backwards? <coughs> Excuse me. It goes behind the heart and then it goes down. So you see a little part of it down here? All of the part of the aorta that goes down the thoracic cavity and then down through the diaphragm and into the abdominal cavity, which is not shown, is called the descending aorta. And we're going to cover that more so on Wednesday. So the left ventricle pumps oxygenated blood into the aorta and then out to the body everywhere, which is the system, so that all of the cells in the body can receive oxygenated blood. And so for that reason, the left ventricle is called the systemic pump. All right, so that's the blood flow. You need to know the blood flow in order. Now, I put this in here uh, in case they do have some pictures, sorry, on uh, the practical from our book, I'm not sure. I haven't viewed it yet. Um, but what you're looking at here is what's called the coronary circuit. It, the, the heart itself has its own blood supply. Now, technically, it's part of the systemic circuit because the blood ultimately, oxygenated, oxygenated blood is going to come up from the left ventricle into the aorta. The only two branches that come off of the ascending aorta are the right and left coronary arteries. That's to ensure that the heart gets oxygenated blood first. So it's receiving oxygenated blood before any other organ in the body. So what you're looking at in this picture is called the coronary arteries. There are two principal coronary arteries, a left one and a right one. Each one of them has two major branches each. The left coronary artery splits into a major branch that goes down the front of the heart uh, in a little groove called the anterior interventricular sulcus. You're going to see that on a model. That branch, that major branch right there is called the anterior interventricular branch. Now in my models book, I call that the anterior interventricular artery to shorten the name because the whole name of this artery, by the way, is called the anterior interventricular branch of the left coronary artery. So it's a whole long name. So, That's like teaching us long because we can't go to Makisha, you have a question? 
Oh, shoot. No. Oh, that's all right. Um, so in my model's book, this is called the anterior interventricular artery. All right. Now, if on the practical, you put in anterior in, uh, interventricular branch and it marks it wrong, I'm going to be going back and I'm grading them by hand. So I'm, I know what all the different right answers are. So you don't need to worry about that. All right. So that's the first branch from the left artery. The second branch courses down the left lateral side of the heart over here. They don't show all of it. That's called the circumflex branch. So those are the two branches from the left coronary artery. The right coronary artery subdivides into a branch that goes down the right lateral side of the heart. It's called the marginal branch. And then the other branch courses posteriorly and goes down a sulcus on the back of the heart. So that's what this little branch is representing back here. That's called the posterior interventricular branch of the right coronary artery. So for that reason, in my model's book, I call it the posterior interventricular artery. All right. Now, um, it, this is also abbreviated the PIB for posterior interventricular branch. The one on the front is also abbreviated AIB for anterior interventricular branch. However, most of you going into nursing, you probably have to learn the older name as well because they still use the older name in a cath lab when they're imaging someone's heart. It's also called the LAD, which stands for left anterior descending artery because it comes from the left coronary artery. It's on the anterior side of the heart and it descends down the heart, LAD. So the LAD is also the one that has a common name uh, called the Widowmaker, if you ever heard of that. Uh, a, a main blockage in this artery gives someone a major heart attack and they can die from it. Well, obviously you can die from a blockage in any of them, but this is the one they call the Widowmaker. All right, so on the, for the veins on the heart, um, there are three main veins that uh, I put in the models book for you to identify. Uh, the one on the anterior side of the heart is called the great cardiac vein, runs in that anterior sulcus. The one that runs in the posterior sulcus on the back of the heart is called the middle cardiac vein. And the largest vein on the heart itself is that coronary sinus I just mentioned. So the coronary sinus lies on the back of the heart. So all of the veins of the heart are draining deoxygenated blood from the heart, ultimately to this coronary sinus. And the coronary sinus is going to dump the blood into this right atrium from the heart itself. All right. So that's the blood flow and, uh, in the circuits of the heart. Does anybody have any question before we move forward? Yes, I do. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so for the coronary circulation section where um, you gave us the, what's it called, the abbreviation, like the PVB, can uh -huh. we put it on the test? Um, I would rather you spell it out on the, um, uh, on the practical, okay. uh, because just because, uh, every once in a while, we're going to be able to use abbreviations. Um, well, I guess you could use the abbreviation. If we were in lab and taking a test physically, I allow people to use their abbreviation. So go ahead and use it. And if it marks it wrong, I'm going to be going through all of them anyway especially any, anything that's marked wrong on it. So just make sure you put the right abbreviation. The, back, the posterior one is PIB. The anterior one is either AIB or the LAD. All right? Okay. All right, very good. Thank you. Now, you're welcome. So let's move on to um, the electrical activity of the heart and how the heart works and the cardiac cycle and the cardiac output and all of that. <laughs> this is going to be, excuse me, hold on one second, Dying. This is going to be a lot of the physiology on the, on the physiology portion of the test. However, we do have to identify um, some of this stuff for the practical examination as well. So <clears throat> ultimately, as you know, probably already, your heart has a pacemaker. Everybody kind of knows that. What you may not know is if you severed every single nerve that goes to the heart, you just severed every nerve that goes to it, 
your heart would still beat in your chest. But you, prob you probably also know if you sever a nerve that goes to a skeletal muscle that you learned in AMP1, the skeletal muscle is paralyzed. Well, skeletal muscle tissue and cardiac muscle tissue are different. Yes, yeah, so a spinal cord injury patient where the, all the neurons are sliced in half, they're paralyzed from that part of the body down. But the heart is different. You can sever every nerve that goes to the heart, which they ultimately do during a heart transplant. The heart's still going to work in the body because what the heart has that skeletal muscle tissue and organs don't have is its own electrical conduction system. I hate to say it this way, so don't use this terminology, but I'm going to say it anyway. It might make it a little easier. The heart has its own nervous system. Now, don't go tell anybody that Professor Russell said that because I'll get fired. It's not a nervous system per se, but I think you might get the point if I say that. So there's a conduction system, and it and it's in, involves five basic parts. So let me just tell you a little bit about how this, the heart develops without getting in, into developmental anatomy and physiology too deep. The heart itself, when it develops in utero in the fetus, some of the cardiac muscle cells lose the ability to contract. They'll never contract again. However, they retain the ability to move ions across their membranes. In which case, when they move ions across the membrane, it generates electrical impulses that you kind of started to learn in AMP1. So all of the cells that lose the ability to contract, but retain the ability to generate and then propagate electrical potentials is part of what we call the conduction system. The majority of all of the cardiac muscle cells though in the heart are what we call contractile fibers. Those are the ones that are involved in contraction to move blood through the heart and then out to the body somewhere that we just went through. So let's go through the parts of the conduction system. First of all, each part of the conduction system has the ability to generate electrical impulses. However, the part of the conduction system that generates the electrical impulses the fastest is called the pacemaker. So the normal pacemaker in someone's heart is this one right here. It's called the sinoatrial node or the SA node. The sinoatrial node is in the posterior wall of the right atrium. So it generates electrical impulses faster than the rest of the system. So it basically sets the pace for electrical generation and propagation. So that's why we call the SA node the pacemaker. Now, if the pacemaker goes out, because you probably know there's some uh, cardiac patients that are candidates for a pacemaker, their pacemaker is not working. You don't just die right away if your pacemaker goes out. We have another part of the conduction system will take over the job of being the pacemaker. And that's the second part of the conduction system called the atrioventricular node or the AV node that you see right here. However, the AV node only sends out electrical impulses about 50 times a minute. So a person that does not have their sinoatrial node working, their resting heart rate is going to be about 50 beats per minute which means they can't do very much physically. They won't die right away. I'm going to tell you how that happens in lecture, not in here, but, um, but their, their heart rate is going to be fairly low. Um, and for that matter, the SA node is the pacemaker. It sends out about 100 electrical impulses a minute. So if you sever every single nerve that goes to the heart, your resting heart rate would be around 100 because there's a part of the nervous system that you learned in AMP1. It's called the parasympathetic nervous system. It fires when you're resting, like you're sitting down now, or if you're lying down, when the parasympathetic system fires, it dumps out acetylcholine on the pacemaker and it slows it down. Acetylcholine is inhibitory on the pacemaker, slows it down. <coughs> and so that's why we have what's called our resting heart rate. The par parasympathetic system slows it down. Your sympathetic system, which is your adrenaline rush system, remember the fight or flight response? Your sympathetic system, when it fires, dumps out 
uh, adrenaline, nor epinephrine and epinephrine on that pacemaker, which speeds it up. So your heart rate is going to go up when you're running on a treadmill because the sympathetic system fires when you're working out, when you're active. All right, so let's go down through the system. The SA node fires, that electrical impulse is going to traverse all of the cardiac muscle cells of the atrial muscle swirl up here. It then goes down to the AV node, which sends the electrical impulse through the next part, which is called the atrioventricular bundle, now, or the AV bundle. Now, this little area right here is vitally important because this little area right here is the only electrical connection between the upper atria and the lower ventricles. So the only way that electrical impulses, which arise up here in the atria, can get down to a ventricle is through the AV node of AV bundle. And if you ever heard of a heart block before, there's three degrees of heart block. There's a, a first degree, second degree, third degree. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Those are problems with electrical conduction from the atria down to a ventricle. And it typically uh, involves the AV node and the AV bundle problems. A, a third degree heart block is a complete heart block. And that's where someone needs a ventricular assisted device uh, put in so that it can send electrical impulses to the ventricles because the lower parts of the conduction system only fire about 20 times a minute. So if the ventricles don't receive electrical impulses from the atria, your ventricles will not contract fast enough in order to support life. You're gonna, you're, you won't live very long if, it's only, if your ventricles are only beating at 20 beats per minute. So the electrical impulses go from the AV node through the AV bundle, and then you notice it splits into these little branches. These are called the bundle branches. There's one for the right side, there's one for the left side. So this is a right bundle branch, this is a left bundle branch, and then they course down towards the apex of the heart, the pointy part. And then they go up and through all of the myocardia or myocardium of the ventricles. So that's the bundle branches, and they, then they go up through the myocardium as what's called Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers are terminating everywhere in a ventricle. So the electrical impulses start way up here, and like a wave of electricity, the electrical impulses course down from the, what's called the base of the heart. This is the base up here. From the base down to the apex and then back up to a ventricle. And that electrical impulse is involved in causing these electrical changes in the cardiac muscle cells. So let's go through this. There's going to be some questions about which types of ions move through which types of channels. So if you don't remember ions and channels and which direction ions move, I'm going to go over that briefly right now from this chart. So electrical impulses are required for any muscle tissue to contract, by the way. Skeletal muscle, you learned in AMP1. Cardiac muscle, we're learning now. Smooth muscle, you covered a little bit in AMP1. All muscle tissue requires an electrical impulse to be generated somewhere. Um, in the heart, it's generated from the conduction system. Now, the nervous system, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems modulate cardiac activity, but they don't set up the normal rhythm. The normal rhythm is coming from the conduction system. So what you're looking at right here is a simple graph that shows an electrical potential change across the membrane of a cardiac muscle cell. So before I can tell you what's going on here, we have to kind of review what this scale is right here. This was introduced to you in chapter 10 and really 12 of AMP1. And so what this is, is a measurement of potential electrical energy across a membrane of a cell. That is to say, if you remember, you have a phospholipid bilayer makes up the membrane. Ions cannot cross the phospholipid bi uh, bilayer. No charged molecule can go across the lipids. It's an insulation against electrical movement. So the only way that ions can get across a membrane, let's say this was the membrane right here, since I can't draw on the screen. You would have the inside of a cell and the outside of a cell. To get ions to move in or out, they would have to go through an ion channel. I'm sure you remember that name. So there's different types of ion channels. Some of them have gates on them or doorways 
that open in response to a change in electrical potential. And any ion channel that opens its doorway when an electrical potential changes is called a voltage gated channel. So voltage is the measurement of potential electrical energy. So if I stuck electrodes on the cardiac muscle cell, let's say I stuck two electrodes on it, just like your electrician at, at your house with the little ohm meter or whatever, checking circuits, the little electrodes. Scientists do that on our cells, by the way. They have little electrodes. So if you stick electrodes on the membrane of the cell, but every single ion channel is closed and no ions are moving whatsoever, you would record a straight line at the number minus 90 for the cardiac muscle cell. You don't have to memorize these numbers, by the way. That's not the goal here. But my point is this. If no ions are moving across the membrane whatsoever, you would just record a straight line because no electrical charges are moving. If, however, you open a sodium channel, remember, sodium is positively charged. It's a positively charged ion, which is called a cation. If you open a sodium channel, sodium always moves to the inside of the cells in our body. Because there's more sodium on the outside than the inside. So if I open a sodium channel right here on this graph, the sodium channel opens right there, sodium is going to rush to the inside of the cell, which is a positive charge. So since this inside of the cell is gaining positive charges, its membrane potential becomes more positive up this number line is becoming more positive so this is what i mean by an electrical difference the membrane potential changes whether or not you're gaining or losing charges so the very first channels that open are called voltage gated sodium channels they open and a whole bunch of sodium enters immediately and causes the membrane potential to become more positive which is always called a depolarization. When the membrane potential becomes more positive, it's called a depolarization. This is always excitatory, depolarizing. Then up here, the voltage-gated sodium channels are gonna close, right there. So sodium stops coming in. However, at the same time the sodium channels were being inactivated, voltage-gated calcium channels are opening. Calcium, like sodium, when you open its channel, will enter the cell. Calcium is positively charged. So if the cell gains positives, you're going to stay positive. So we, we became positive at first through what's called rapid depolarization for the entry of sodium. We then stay positive for a while through an, a part of the cycle called the plateau phase. And we're staying positive because of the influx of calcium. So calcium maintains this depolarization, but it's also important because calcium is the trigger for contraction. It's gonna make the cardiac muscle cell contract. But then over here, the calcium channels are gonna close and then we're going to open voltage-gated potassium channels. Now, whenever you open a potassium channel on any cell in the body, potassium always leaves. And potassium is positively charged. So if the cell loses positive charges, it's going to become negative. You gain positives, you become positive. You lose positives, you become negative. So as the cell begins to lose potassium, it then becomes negative again, back down to what we call its resting membrane potential, the RMP down here, and that's called repolarization. So the cell has to depolarize to contract, and then it has to repolarize to relax. And that's what our cardiac muscle cells are gonna do. We want them to contract in order to pump blood. We want them to relax to fill back up with blood. We want the heart to contract to pump blood. We want the heart to relax to fill up with blood. It alternates between contraction and relaxation.
Also, you're going to read the term systole and diastole. We're going to pretty much cover that next time when we do blood vessels. But nonetheless, systole is the contraction phase of the heart. And diastole is relaxation. So the heart only it pumps blood out during systole. And it fills with blood during diastole. So I'm going to mention that on Wednesday as well. All right, you're probably going to have to, well, I know you're going to have to identify the parts of an EKG. So if you're unfamiliar with the EKG, an EKG is called the electrocardiogram. The electrocardiogram is a physical tracing of the electrical activity of somebody's heart. And what you're looking at on the screen is what we call a typical type 2 lead. And what we see on a typical type 2 lead are what are referred to as waves or deflections. So if you notice here at zero, if the heart didn't have any electrical activity at all, it would just be a flat line right here. And that's why when someone dies and their heart stops beating, it's called flatlining because the line right here stays flat. However, if someone's heart is working and it's working normally and they're in sin what's called sinus rhythm, you'll see blip, 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 blip. You like my sound effect? Yeah, I love it. You'll see a blip, a blip, blip, and a blip. So ultimately, th there are several waves that you have to identify and certain time periods that we have to know what they do. We have to know how to identify the wave and we have to know what the wave represents. So what you're looking at with the EKG basically is a recording of what happens with the electrical conduction system of the heart that we just went through and the electrical cycle of the heart, which this graph shows the electrical cycle. When the cells become positive and they plateau or they become negative again, can be represented on the EKG. So let's just start with the first wave. The first wave that we're going to see on a type 2 lead is the P wave. The P wave is represent, if you, if you see the P wave automatically on someone's EKG strip, you know their pacemaker is working. Because as soon as the SA node fires, you would record the P wave. Now, the P wave obviously represents SA nodal firing but it also represents the fact that the atria are going to be depolarized and then contract. So about midway to two thirds of the way through the wave, which they don't show here, the atria are completely depolarized and then we get subsequent atrial contraction. So the P wave represents atrial depolarization and contraction and the fact that the SA node fired. Now, when the atria contract, where do you think the blood goes? You don't have to really answer it, but if you're trying to answer it. When the atria contract, the blood goes through their AV valve down to a ventricle. So then the electrical potential goes through the atria, goes down to the AV node, and then the AV bundle, down through the, the AV branches that we just covered, all of this. So the next part of the cardiac cycle is where the electrical potential does this. All right, so first of all, the SA node fires, the atria all become depolarized and you record the P wave. The electrical potential then goes through the AV node, through the AV bundle, through the bundle branches, and then up through all of the Purkinje fibers, and we then would record the QRS complex. The QRS complex is a complex series of waves it's called the Q wave, the R wave, and the S wave. The QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization and then contraction. Oh, notice here also it's color coded. Atrial contraction for this first part right here, and then ventricular contraction just after the QRS complex begins. So the QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization and subsequent contraction. This ST segment is a time period uh, between the end of the S wave and the beginning of what's called the T wave. The ST segment 
represents the time period on the electrical cycle that's called the plateau phase, right here, the plateau phase. Then you get the T wave. The T wave represents ventricular repolarization and subsequent relaxation. Ventricular repolarization and subsequent relaxation. So here's repolarization right here. So what causes repolarization? Oh, the loss of potassium because voltage gated potassium channels are gonna open. We're gonna lose potassium, which is positively charged and we're going to repolarize and then we have subsequent relaxation. Relaxation starts about two waves through, two thirds of the way through the T wave. All right, so P wave is for the atria, QRS is for the ventricle, and the T wave is for the ventricle. I wrote that down in the, in the book. It's also in the Engage manual, all right? We also have something called the PQ interval. I think in the Engage manual, the more representative term is the PR interval just because it's easier to measure the R wave on the EKG strip because it's the biggest wave that you see right away. I don't know if you've ever been in a hospital and you saw the little monitor and you, and you see little blips and all of a sudden you see boom, boom, like a big wave goes up. That's always the R wave. So let me just tell you what the PQ interval is, which is indicative of the, what the PR wave is. The PQ interval is the time period it takes for the electrical potential to traverse the entire heart. And notice it's 200 milliseconds, 0.2 seconds. The entire cardiac cycle at rest lasts 0.8 seconds, which is 800 milliseconds. There's a thousand milliseconds in one second. So one heartbeat at rest in an average individual lasts less than one second, 0.8 seconds. Now that's give or take, it could go up, can go down, it depends on what you're doing, what medications you're on, all sorts of things, right? But nonetheless, let's look at the conduction system for the PQ interval. So the PQ interval is a time it takes for the electrical impulse to be generated by the SA node, to go to the AV node, to the AV bundle, the bundle branches, and through all the Purkinje fibers. Faster than you can snap your finger is 0.2 seconds. That's how long it takes for the electrical electrical impulse to traverse the whole heart. All right, um, so in some people that had a previous heart attack or infection, they can get scar tissue build up in the heart and scar tissue does not propagate electrical impulses. So their PQ or PR interval might be a little longer than normal. So doctors can look at that. All right, so just know what each wave represents and know how to identify the waves on the EKG. The last couple things that we have to cover, because I know your brain's probably tired. The last couple things that we have to cover are probably some of the most important with respect to the physiology test. So I'm gonna try and slow down just a little bit. I, I know I was talking kind of quickly because I, I wanna spend a little bit of time on what's called cardiac output. Now, I haven't figured a way out how to write on the screen yet, so I'm gonna try and just, you know, put up some PowerPoints like this with a couple little notes in them every once in a while. I know there's a way you can do it. I just can't do it from this monitor yet, um, but I'm gonna try and figure that out. But nonetheless, we need to know what cardiac output is, which is abbreviated CO. <coughs> cardiac output is the amount of blood, volume of blood that is ejected from the right and left ventricles every minute. So a common way of saying it, how much blood does your, does your heart pump out every minute <clears throat> is the cardiac output. Cardiac output is unit is milliliters per minute. So the average person, male, has about five to six liters of blood. The average female has about four to five liters, and that's give or take your body size. If you have a female that's six foot tall, she's gonna have a little bit more blood than a five foot tall male, all right? So that's just averages. Now, the reason why I'm telling you that is because of this. 
right now while you're sitting down and you're not physically active, you already know you have what's called your low resting heart rate. Everybody knows that because you know when you start running around, your heart rate goes up. Y'all know that. Well, at rest, we also have what's called our low resting cardiac output. And as it turns out, in an average individual where everything's working normally, your heart, your ventricles pumps your total blood volume in one minute, which is kind of amazing. If you trace a drop of blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle, to the pulmonary trunk, to the lungs, back to the left atrium, to the left ventricle, to the aorta, to the body, and back to the right atrium again, to the cycle that we just went through a while ago, would take one minute. Now, if you're running and you're vigorously working out, your heart can pump four to five times that resting cardiac output. That means in one minute, your heart can pump four to five times your total blood volume. How amazing is that? Pretty amazing. So we need to figure out how the heart is doing that. So first of all, the cardiac output is dependent upon two parameters, something called stroke volume, which is abbreviated SV, and heart rate that you already know, HR, heart rate. So if you know how many times a minute your heart is beating, and you know how much blood your heart is pumping out on each individual beat, you could determine and calculate your cardiac output. So how much blood is pumped out on each beat is called the stroke volume. So how the volume of blood pumped out on each stroke of the heart is stroke volume. So we need to know that. And I'm going to tell you how we know that in a minute or how you can calculate it. So stroke volume, the amount of blood you pump out on each beat times the number of times a minute your heart beats will give you the volume of blood that your heart beats in one minute, pumps out in one minute, right? Because if you look at the calculation, beats are going to cancel out over here. So what you're left with is volume milliliters per minute. So that's cardiac output. Now, if you're in my lecture, I just pulled this from our lecture PowerPoint, but um, I, for everybody in the lab that's not in my lecture, I think these videos and animations are good. So I left this one in here for cardiac output. You can view that later on sometime, but you have to be connected to the internet to click on it. So let's look at what stroke volume involves. So cardiac output is uh, dependent upon two things only, stroke volume and heart rate. But there are parameters that affect both of them. So I want you to know the parameters that affect stroke volume. So I'm gonna define them for you right here. Try and keep it as simple as I can for lab. We're gonna get into a little more detail in lecture. But nonetheless, here are the three parameters that affect stroke volume, All right? So the first one is called the preload. Oh, I didn't put it in here. Uh, let me see. Hmm. Let me see if I can type it in. The preload. The preload is the degree to which the ventricular wall is stretched. How stretched is the ventricle wall means something with when it goes to contract. So in other words, uh, I always like to describe this like you stretching a rubber band. If you take a rubber band and you stretch it a little bit and let it go, it's going to snap back with some force. But if you stretch it a whole lot, and you let it go, it's gonna snap back with more force. Well, our ventricular wall is similar to that. If we can put more blood volume in a ventricle prior to the ventricle, the ventricle trying to contract, then the wall of the ventricle is gonna stretch more because you filled up more in the ventricle. So when you fill up the ventricle more with blood before it contracts, that blood volume has a name. And the name of that blood volume is called the EDV. So I'm going to try and write it in here because I, I didn't see it. So let me go back. Um, stroke volume is going to equal the end 
Whoops, hold on. My bad. It, I did it again. All right, and diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume, right? So the end diastolic volume, let me see if I can put it under there, is called the EDV. The end systolic volume is called the ESB. And so stroke volume equals the EDV minus the ESB. So let me tell you what that all means. Everything is really about this EDV right here. The end diastolic volume. The end diastolic volume is the volume of blood in the ventricle just prior to the ventricle beginning to contract. And the EDV is the total blood volume that is in the ventricle that the ventricle has available to pump out. And you know why? Because the ventricles can only fill with blood if they are relaxing. Once the ventricle begins to contract, everybody knows this, I think, once the ventricles begin to contract, they're trying to squish the blood back out. They're trying to eject the blood out. So you, once the ventricle begins to contract, you can't put any more blood into it. So whatever volume of blood is in the ventricle at the end of ventricular relaxation or at the end of ventricular diastole is the volume of blood that the ventricle has available to pump out. Now, called the EDV. So, if there are some things that can increase the EDV, meaning you put more blood in a ventricle, it will stretch the wall of the ventricle even more, and that stretched wall of the ventricle is called the preload. So anything that increases the EDV increases the preload. And anything that increases the preload increases the force of contraction of the ventricle. And if you increase the force of contraction of the ventricle, you're going to eject more blood out of the ventricle. Which leads me to this term. See, right now, you all probably think when the ventricle contracts, that all of the blood ejects out of the ventricle on that contraction. Well, it doesn't. After the ventricle contracts, there's some blood left in the ventricle. The little bit of blood that is left in a ventricle after it has finished contracting is called the end systolic volume or the ESV. So, the ventricle doesn't eject all of the blood out. It ejects a good bit of it out. It depends on how hard it's contracting. But right now at rest, your end systolic volume is relatively high. Your ventricle leaves about 50 to 60 milliliters of blood in your ventricle. And your ventricle at rest receives about 130 mils or so, 125 to 135 mils. So at the end of ventricular contraction, we still have about 50, 60 mils left in there, which is good for us because we're only sitting down. We, we don't need that blood yet. But if you get up and you go run on a treadmill, luckily our heart has a cardiac reserve and it can tap into that little bit of blood that's normally not ejecting out. How do we do that? Well, you put more blood in the ventricle to begin with which increases the stretch on the ventricle, which is called the preload, so that when it goes to contract, it snaps back harder and basically contracts harder and ejects more blood out on that beat, which means if you're ejecting more blood out on that beat, you're left with less blood in the ventricle. 
So the ESV would go down. So here's how this works. If I increase the EDV, which I'm going to give you some examples in a minute, I increase the stretch on the heart, which is the preload. If I increase the preload, I incre increase contraction force. If I increase contraction force, I decrease the ESV. And by increase it, decreasing the ESV, I increase the stroke volume. I mean, let's look at this simple equation I put here. If you put to just so bogus numbers in here, uh, say the EDV was five and the ESV was one. If you do that simple uh, subtraction, the SV would be four. However, if I say that the EDV was say three and the ESV was, well, let's do 10 and let's do five, makes it easier. Then the SV would be five. However, if I increase the EDV, say just up to 11 or 12, the, it would stretch the heart even more, which is the preload. We contract even more. And now if we did that subtraction, the SV would be higher because the ESV would be much lower. You leave less blood in the heart, the harder you contract. So if the EDV goes up and the ESV goes down, the amount of blood you ejected out goes up. So anything that increases the EDV, the stretch on the heart, the preload, would increase contraction force. You eject more blood out, which means the ESV went down and stroke volume went up. So why is stroke volume so important? because cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. So anything that makes the stroke volume go up makes the cardiac output go up. Anything that makes heart rate go up makes your cardiac output go up. All right, so then we have contractility directly. Obviously, anything that makes the, the ventricle contract harder than normal, which is called contractility, would cause an increased stroke volume which I just mentioned, but there are some agents that can increase stroke volume. Any drug chemical that can increase the contraction force of the heart is called a positive inotropic agent. We're going to cover that in lecture, but I think in the engage manual, they at least talk about sympathetic stimulation. When you start running on a treadmill, not only does your heart rate go up, but the stroke volume is going to go up because the sympathetic nervous system dumps out adrenaline all over your heart, which increases contraction force. So increased contractility increases stroke volume, which increases cardiac output. Now this afterload is something we can't control physiologically. The afterload is the bottom number of your blood pressure. I really don't want to get into a whole lot of detail with that right now, but the afterload is a pressure. It is the pressure that must be generated by a ventricle before the semilunar valves can open. So let me go back to this picture real quick. You see right here in the frontal section of the heart, the left ventricle is trying to eject blood into the aorta. However, before this semilunar valve can open, the pressure of the blood in the left ventricle has to be higher than the pressure of the blood that is pushing back against that valve. The pressure of the blood that is pushing back against this valve is the afterload, which is the bottom number of your blood pressure. So you guys know blood pressure a little bit, how there's two numbers, right? 120 over 80. Well, that top number is the blood pressure when the ventricle is ejecting blood into the artery, actively undergoing systole, ejecting blood into an artery, the pressure in the artery when the ventricle is actively ejecting blood into it is the top number. The blood pressure in the artery while the ventricle is relaxing is the bottom number. That's why it's called the diastolic value. So the afterload then is basically the diastolic value. What is the pressure against the semilunar valve? It's the diastolic blood pressure. It's the bottom number of your blood pressure, which is just called the afterload. So here's the deal. 
before the ventricles can eject blood into their artery, they have to generate a pressure that is greater than the afterload in order for the semilunar valves to open. Now, the pressures on the left side of the heart are much higher than the right side of the heart. I'm going to get into that in lecture. But nonetheless, let's say somebody has high blood pressure, and specifically their bottom number is high. If their bottom number is high, their pressure above the semilunar valve obviously is high, which means their ventricle is going to have to contract even harder than normal to open that valve. And over a long period of time, that hypertensive action in the body damages valves in the, in the heart. It damages walls in our blood vessels and with that higher pressure that has to be generated to move blood. And that's why hypertension is called the silent killer. Because people have hypertension, they feel fine because you don't really feel it. And, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. And then, you know, they can drop dead all of a sudden, which would be obviously bad. That's why you have to go get it all checked out. All right, so that's the afterload. So here's the deal with this. Anything that increases preload increases stroke volume. Anything that increases contractility increases stroke volume. But if you increase the afterload, you decrease stroke volume. And if you can decrease your afterload, which can only happen with changing your lifestyle, you have to eat right, you have to exercise, or you might be on hypertensive medications that bring your blood pressure down, can drop your afterload. So if we can decrease our afterload a number of ways, then that can help stabilize or increase your stroke volume. So this one is just the opposite to the other two parameters. All right. All right. I also put in here the summary chart uh, that we're going to go through in a minute. But before we do that, I need you guys to know what these receptors do right here. What you're looking at right here, and I think this is a hyperlink, yeah, you can look at this regulation animation at home uh, later, click on it when you're on the internet. What you're looking at here is the control center for the heart, the cardiovascular center, which is located in the medulla oblongata, if you remember that from AMP1. Remember you have the brain stem, you got the, uh, the medulla oblongata, the pods and the uh, midbrain that make up the brain stem. So the medulla oblongata is where the cardiovascular center is located. So what you're looking at are what we call the sensory inputs and then the motor outputs. Here's how it works. This uh, cardiovascular center all day long analyzes information. What is your body doing? Are you lying down? Are you, what's the uh, chemical changes occurring in your blood? All of this sensory input comes into the cardiovascular center. The cardiovascular center then has to make a determination as to what type of motor output is required to keep you healthy. This is basically a reflex you learned about, homeostatic feedback loop you learned about in AMP1. So we have sensory inputs and we have motor outputs. So let me go through them. We have sensory inputs from the higher brain centers like your cerebral cortex, you learned in AMP1. You might not have covered the limbic system, but that's your emotional brain. If you get really scared or excited, your heart rate can go up. That's because sensory inputs coming from the limbic system. And then the hypothalamus, you, you learned about a little bit in AMP1, and we covered it a little bit in the endocrine system, has some inputs as well. It's a major relay station for not only the endocrine system, but also the sympathetic and parasympathetic system in the nervous system. I know there's going to be some questions on these receptors. So you have to know what these receptors do. And I'm going to go through a real life example with you in a second. So there's different types of receptors around our body that have the job of monitoring different type of stimulation or inputs. I'm sorry, senses. So the first receptors called proprioceptors are receptors that are found in and around all the joints in the body around your muscles and your joints in your body. The proprioceptors monitor the movements of your arms and legs and your head and all of that. So basically the proprioceptors would fire to the CV center. If you, if you start to run on a treadmill, the very first reason why your heart rate goes up is because the proprioceptors fire to the CV center saying, hey, we're moving. Let's prepare to send more blood to our muscles. 
So we have sympathetic output that increases cardiac output. And I'll talk about in a second, which sends more blood to your muscles because you're running. So that's called the proprioceptive reflex. When we change cardiac output in relation to body movement. We also have things called chemoreceptors. The first part of that word chemo means chemical. So the chemoreceptors are located in two different places in our body. There are some chemoreceptors that are found in the large blood vessels in your body, like the aorta and your carotid arteries. Those are called peripheral chemoreceptors, peripheral, because they're found in the periphery of your body. But we also have chemoreceptors that are found in the central nervous system, specifically in the medulla oblongata and other parts of the uh, brainstem. So these chemoreceptors, the one in the periphery of your body, monitor chemical changes in the blood. Yep, our body knows how much oxygen is in your blood, how much CO2 is in your blood, and how much, P uh, and what the pH of your blood is. Sorry, emails keep coming through. What the pH of your blood is. Your blood pH is supposed to be between 735 and 745 on a pH scale. We're going to cover that later. But if your pH starts to drop below 7.35, then you become acidic. That, uh-oh, everybody went away. Can y'all still hear me? Oh, there it is. Very good. Yes. Um, so when you start to work out, your muscles produce acids. You already know lactic acid. Your pH starts to drop a little bit. So these chemoreceptors say, hey, the pH is dropping, we're becoming acidic. Or the, the muscles start taking out more oxygen because they're working out, the oxygen level goes down. Or more CO2 gets put into the blood. Those three parameters are what I call the Tom Russell workout analogy, by the way. If you're working out, your muscles will take out more oxygen, so your oxygen load goes down. It's called the PO2, it goes down, because your muscles use more oxygen. Since your muscles are working out more, they're making more ATP aerobically. So they're, they're putting in more CO2 in the blood. So your CO2 level goes up. And they're making more acid, so you become acidic. So if your pH goes down, CO2 goes up, and O2 goes down, that means you're working out. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you're working out, the CV center says, yep, they're working out. Appropriate receptors are firing, say, yep, they're moving their muscles. Chemoreceptors are saying, we don't have enough oxygen. We have too much CO2 and our pH is too low. So guess what this, this cardiovascular center does? It sends out sympathetic output to the heart. Sympathetic output to the heart via the cardiac accelerator nerves increases both your heart rate and the force of contraction of the ventricle, which increases stroke volume. So our brain always knows what the chemical changes are and if you're moving and if we need to send out sympathetic output. Sympathetic output is in the form of norepinephrine from the, from the nerves and epinephrine and norepinephrine from your adrenal medulla, the gland. Basically, it's adrenaline and noradrenaline. You get an adrenaline rush. So sympathetic output increases heart rate by increasing your pacemaker activity. It increases stroke volume by increasing the contractility of the ventricles. Both of those things increases your cardiac output. And if you increase cardiac output, you increase blood pressure and blood flow to your muscles. Now, baroreceptors, which I, I believe they still have that in the engaged chapter right now. We're gonna talk about these again uh, on Wednesday. The baroreceptors monitor blood pressure. So that's more so a talk for Wednesday. But if your blood pressure starts to go down, the baroreceptors fire to the CV center. CV center says, yep, blood pressure is too low. We better increase blood pressure. So how do we increase blood pressure? You have to increase cardiac output. That's achieved with sympathetic stimulation. On the other hand, if someone's blood pressure is going up too high, the baroreceptors fire to the CV center and says, yep, blood pressure is too high. CV center then wants to bring your blood pressure down, and it does so in a couple of ways. One way is by decreasing cardiac output. So the way that we decrease cardiac output is through parasympathetic stimulation to the heart. 
And that's acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to what we call a muscarinic 2 receptor on the pacemaker, which is inhibitory. And your pacemaker slows down and your heart rate goes down. And if your heart rate goes down, cardiac output goes down, which brings your blood, your blood pressure down. All right, so that's the inputs and the outputs. The main th goal here is to know what the receptors do and what type of stimulation increases or decrease cardiac output, stroke volume, and heart rate, and all of that from here. Now, I'll put in here the summary chart from your lecture book. I'm going to briefly go over it here. This is a summary of everything that I just mentioned, or almost everything that I just mentioned. Um, and then I'm going to let you guys take a break, or we'll be done for the day. You can ask questions, and then you can go do your homework and whatnot. All right, so first of all, here's cardiac output over here in the very middle of the summation chart. They show you two people running down a trail right here. So obviously if they're running, there are gonna be changes in the body that try to increase cardiac output because their muscles need more blood flow to them because they're working out. <clears throat> so how do we increase cardiac output? Well, cardiac output is dependent upon two things. So here's how you read this chart. And I think the chart makes it kind of easy. Cardiac output is dependent on stroke volume, this parameter, and heart rate, and that's it. So anything that makes heart, uh, stroke volume go up makes cardiac output go up. Anything that makes heart rate go up makes cardiac output go up. So what are the parameters that affect stroke volume and heart rate? Well, they're these. Stroke volume is affected by the preload. Anything that makes the preload increase, remember that's a stretch on the wall of a ventricle. So if you can stretch the wall of a ventricle more than normal, just before it contracts, it's going to contract harder. So how do we increase the preload? Well, you increase the EDV. Now you increase the EDV in a couple of ways. So for people that already work in the nursing field, you probably know, and other people know, if you get a patient that's dehydrated, what's the very first thing that you need to do for that patient? You don't have to answer out loud. Some of you know, some of you don't. Well, the first thing you want to do is hang an IV bag on them and repl replenish the fluid, right? Well, you might not even know why you need to do that. Someone that is moderately to severely dehydrated have low blood pressure. Their, their, dry, their pressure is plummeting. And you could die from that. It's called hypovolemic shock. So how do you increase their pressure? Hmm, well, if you hang an IV bag on them, you infiltrate more fluid into their body. The more fluid you put in their body allows more fluid to return to the heart. And if you return more blood to the heart, which is called venous return, you're going to increase how much blood gets in a ventricle. And if you increase how much blood gets in a, into a ventricle, which is called the EDV, you increase the preload. So by infiltrating fluid in the body, you increase how much blood returns to the heart called venous return which increases the EDV, which increases the preload and increases stroke volume contractility, then stroke volume and thus cardiac output. Now, obviously these two people that are running in this picture don't have an IV bag hanging on them. So how does that work with a person that's not having an IV bag on them? Well, you still increase what the return of blood to the heart when you're working out because of this which you may or may not know. If you are using your muscles, your muscles squeeze on the veins in the body and all veins in the body have valves in them. So when you're using your muscles, your muscles are contracting, relaxing, contracting, relaxing. It squishes on the vein, which squishes the blood back to the heart faster. That's called venous return. So as you work out, you automatically increase the volume of blood returning to the heart through venous return, which increases the EDV, which increases the preload, which increases contractility, which increases stroke volume and increases cardiac output. So that's venous return. You increase venous return, you increase the EDV, you increase the preload, you increase contractility and stroke volume and cardiac output. Now there are agents that increase contractility directly and the majority of them manipulate how much calcium gets 
to the inside of the cell. So I'm not going through all of these. We're going to do it for lecture though. So if you're in my lecture, you need to learn it anyway. Um, sympathetic stimulation and the release of, of catecholamines, which is epinephrine and norepinephrine, by the way. Catecholamines uh, from the adrenal medulla, glucagon and thyroid hormone all help increase in some form or fashion without getting into it now, calcium loads on the inside of the cell. So anything that increases calcium on the inside of the cell is called a positive inotropic agent and they increase the force of contraction. If you increase the force of contraction of a ventricle, you increase stroke volume and you increase cardiac output. The afterload is the only parameter that can affect stroke volume that we cannot control physiologically in our body. The afterload we can't control. Now you can change it if you change your lifestyle, you diet right, you eat all your fruits and vegetables and, and you know, you're not eating ice cream and cake every night. Sorry, guys, but that's not the way to do it. But uh, you eat right, uh, exercise. If you're on hypertensive meds, that can all keep your afterload low or at a normal level. The afterload, it, when it gets above 93 and above, 90 and above for your afterload is hypertension one. For your bottom number. So your normal bottom number is anywhere from, you know, 70 to 80 or 65 to 75, uh, 70 to 80, even 85, you're not too worried about. You start getting into the low 90s or even someone with a, a, a afterload or a bottom number of 100, you need to go to the doctor. All right. That is not good at all. All right, so we can't control the afterload physiologically, so that's the only oddball here. What about heart rate? Well, heart rate mainly is controlled by the nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. You already know, because I just mentioned it, if you are physically active, your sympathetic nervous system fires. Whenever you're physically active, that's the system that's firing, your sympathetic system. So the sympathetic system would fire when you're physically active and it dumps out nor epinephrine on the pacemaker and your heart rate goes up. If your heart rate goes up, your cardiac output goes up. Now, while you're just sitting down right now or when you go to bed and you lie down, your parasympathetic system fires throughout the day when you're resting or you're not very physically active. The parasympathetic system dumps out acetylcholine on the pacemaker and it binds to those muscarinic two receptors. It's inhibitory. Those muscarinic 2 receptors, by the way, are, are chemically gated potassium channels, if anybody wants to know how it, because when you lose potassium, it causes repolarization. So it inhibits the, the pacemaker, your heart rate goes down, and then your cardiac output would go down. We also have chemical agents that can alter heart rate, except they're not called inotropic. They would be called a chronotropic agent. The prefix chrono means time. So any agent that increases heart rate would be called a positive chronotropic agent. And any chemical that decreases heart rate would be a negative chronotropic agent. So some positive chronotropes are the catecholamines. Epinephrine, norepinephrine increase heart rate. A negative chronotropic agent is acetylcholine or any parasympathomimetic drug, drugs that mimic the parasympathetic nervous system. Thyroid hormones also working together with the catecholamines. It doesn't work alone, but works together with the catecholamines, helps increase heart rate. For that matter, increases contractility as well. So anything that increases heart rate increases cardiac output. Now, if you notice over here for other factors, these are other parameters that we can't control conscious, uh, physiologically in our body. So, but our heart rates change, our normal heart rates change throughout our lifetime. Infants have faster heart rates than we do. Females typically have higher heart rates than males, give or take uh, physical activity, uh, that, how healthy the person is and all the physical fitness and all of that. Um, your body temperature plays a role in it. I don't know if you ever noticed, but when you have a, a fever, like when you have the flu or something, um, you might notice that your heart rate is higher than normal. You have a, a rapid weak pulse. You kind of, you're sweating and all from the fever. 
when your body temperature goes up, it makes your heart rate go up. That's why your, your, your pulse is rapid when you're sick and have fever. So we can't change that. These just happen throughout our lifetime. All right, so that's the summary chart and that's the physiology that you have to cover. Now, when sort of in order from this little PowerPoint I put together with the information that's in the engage manual. That's why I, I wrote it, that I, that's why I put them together this way. So make sure you review both the information in the engage manual as well as this PowerPoint. All right, does anybody have any questions about what I just went over? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing this PowerPoint screen then and come back here. All right, so I know you guys are tired. You're uh, more than welcome uh, to you know, leave the, the meeting at this point. We spent a couple hours in here. Just make sure if you haven't done those assignments yet, technically they're supposed to be done today. All of the exercise two assignments. You're more than welcome to stay in the meeting and work on it while you're here. That's fine as well, all right? Uh, before I let y'all go or whoever's gonna stay, let me see if any of these people came in the room. Abdil Jabbar, unmute yourself and holler at me if you're here. Um, Chad or McCaskill, Navar, Raphael, and Makisha Stewart. No. All right. Well, I'm absent. All right, so um, if you guys want to stay in the room, that's fine. Uh, for that, if you're going to do that, let's take a break. I have to go uh, take a break myself for a minute. My throat is hurting. And I will be back in 15 minutes if you're still in the room. But before I go to take my break, does anybody have any questions? I have a quick question. Okay. What would be the best way to study for the physiology? Because I felt like I couldn't keep up with it. I don't know. It was kind of like a lot. So It is a lot. So, oh, oh, good. I'm so glad I pushed the record button. So you might have to go back and review this recording. But the easiest way to do it, Ashley, is to have the printout of the exercise two, just, just the physiology part in the first part of the chapter, and you'll notice if you read through um, the text information in the chapter, it's going to follow along with this PowerPoint. So that's why, I, like for lecture, when we have lecture, the PowerPoint is going to be bigger. There's more stuff in it. But I put in here in our PowerPoint the information that goes in the order of the Engage manual. And that's where I'm going to be getting uh, my questions from what I said in here on this video and that engage manual in this PowerPoint. So as you're reviewing this physiology tonight and into tomorrow, if you have a question about it, just shoot me an email. And if, if we can't, if I can't clear it up via email, we'll do it at, at the beginning of class on Wednesday. Does that okay, help thank you? you. Okay. You're welcome. All right. So, um, if, you, if, if you're out of the room when I get back, that's fine. Just make sure you get your assignments done. If you want to wait until I get back, if you have a question, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and mute my mic. When I unmute my mic, that means I'm back in the room. All right. So if you're staying in the room, that's fine. Just do your work. Or if you need to take a break and then just come back, it'll be about 15 minutes. So uh, looking at about 12, 15. All right. Let me see if I can pull that up. Let me go to share. Share screen again. Let's see if I can pull one of the pictures up. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. All right. Let's see where that's at. Let's see what the image gallery. Do you know where they are exactly? 
Um, oh, right it here. just, yeah. Model video, let's see what image. All right. Um, oh, so they have numbers on them already, right? Yeah. You, you just, just want to know what the answers are. Yeah. yeah now, all the I'm, models are labeled in my models book. The only, the only, actually the only thing on a model that they might have labeled that is not in my models book is this valve right here. Because okay. when I took a picture, when I took the pictures of the heart, I didn't tilt it up. It, it, literally, the heart has to be tilted up. You have to take the picture from almost underneath it to see this. So this is the aortic semilunar valve. So just to show you from this view of this model, this is the anterior view of the model, which means when it's like if you're looking at a patient on a table, the right side of the patient is, is your left side and vice versa. So if you were standing in front of me looking at my chest and you saw my heart, what's on my right would be on your left and vice versa. So this is the left side of the heart. Oh, I forgot to tell you all that as well. The easy way to determine left and right, by the way, uh, if the heart's open, is the thickness of the wall of the heart right here. I forgot to tell you all that. So, all right, so for instance, look how thick this, this layer is right here, the myocardium, compared to this little bitty layer. Y'all see that difference? So the thickness of the musculature is different from the right side to the left side. The left side of the heart has the harder job. It the left ventricle has to pump blood to your big toe and all the way back to the heart. So it has to have stronger muscle, thicker muscle. The right ventricle only pumps blood to the lungs and back. So it doesn't have to pump it very far. So the thickness of, of the musculature there called the myocardium is thinner. All right. So from this view of this heart, this is the left ventricle. This is the, the chamber, not this. There's different things labeled, but the, the open space is the ventricle. The open space on this side would be the right ventricle. The space and the, the tissue in the middle that separates the chambers from each other is called a septum. So this is the interventricular septum, separates the ventricles. Uh, but we can see all four valves in the heart from this view. On my pictures of a model's book, you can only see three. You can see this one, this one, and that one. You can't necessarily see this aortic valve. So this valve under here separates the left ventricle from the aorta up here. This valve right here is the pulmonary semilunar valve, which separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk. So these are the two semilunar valves. One separates the pulmonary trunk from the right ventricle. One separates the aorta from the left ventricle. So that's the one you can't see. The valves that have the little strings on them called the chordae tendineae, there's two of those. One's on the left side of the heart, and one's on the right side of the heart. The AV valve on the left side is called the bicuspid or mitral valve. The one on the right side of the heart is called the tricuspid valve. Now, the roof of an atrium, which we see here from the top, this little flap up here, is called an auricle. A-U-R-I-C-L-E, yeah. auricle. Um, and the inside of it is, is the actual chamber, which I'll scroll in a minute to show you. So from the outside, some students put atrium and some students put the auricle. I normally count it, count for both. But nonetheless, from the anterior view, you also inside the chambers of the heart, ventricle, I should say, wherever these little chordae tendineae insert into the wall of the ventricle, like these insert down here, and those over there you can't see, where they're inserting into the myocardium of the ventricle, it's an enlarged portion of the muscle. That's always called the papillary muscle, where the, the cords are inserting. So the papillary muscle 
on, in the left ventricle is quite large. The papillary muscle, and you always know where it's at because the strings are going in there, is, is a little bit smaller on the right side. So those are the four valves of the heart. Um, here's the same model from a right lateral view. Here's the right coronary artery, the red one that we talked about coming from the ascending aorta. And it goes, it branches. One branch goes down the right lateral side of the heart. That's called the marginal branch. And then see how it goes behind the heart? Back there, it turns into that PIB I was talking about. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. But they have the, the right auricle open, like the flap is open. Like on this particular model, it hinges open. So the inside of this is the right atrium. Notice up here, though, they have this, the inside wall of the chambers are not flat. They have these little rigid muscle tissue in it. The rigid muscle tissue in an atrium is called pectinate muscle. P-E-C-T-I-N-A-T-E, -E, pectinate muscle. Um, in the ventricle, these little bands of irregular muscle tissue in the ventricle is called trabeculae carni. So it's just some weird names. But nonetheless, that's the right atrium right there. Um, Here's just an external view, say, of anterior view of the heart. There's the left auricle over here. That's the right auricle. Um, and there's grooves on the heart. There's a groove on the front. You see how it indents a little bit, allows for the blood vessel to run up and down. And there's a groove on the back. The groove on the front, and the grooves are called salsi, a sulcus. The one on the front is called the anterior interventricular sulcus. Anterior because it's the anterior side of the heart. And the word interventricular means between ventricles. So externally on the heart, this is a landmark. On our left side, if we're looking at the anterior side of the heart, to the left of the, the sulcus, this is all of the right ventricle over here. And just on the right side of that, sulcus from the apex up that's all the left ventricle externally um, this is the pulmonary trunk it subdivides into arteries that's a pulmonary artery the left one on this side the right one goes back there we can't see it from this view um, these are the left pulmonary veins from the back you can see the other two comes from the right lung the right ones this is the superior vena cava only from this branch down this is called the right brachiocephalic vein right here. We're going to do that next week, uh, Wednesday. And then this is uh, the right jugular right here. So where the jugular and the subclavian veins meet, from that point down, it forms the vena cava. This is the arch of the aorta. This is ascending just up to here. It arches over, then it goes down called descending. There's three branches on the human arch of the aorta. The first branch, this one, is called the brachiocephalic branch. The middle one is actually the left carotid artery. And the third one over here is the left subclavian artery. So we're going to redo those on Wednesday. So let me go back up to, oh, here's the back of the heart, or the model. So... <clears throat> Here is what would become the descending aorta. We come back around the back of the heart. This is the right pulmonary artery over here. Goes to the, um, uh, yeah, it goes to the right lung. This is the left pulmonary artery. Goes to the left lung. These are the right pulmonary veins coming from the right lung. These are the left pulmonary veins coming from the left lung. This is the inferior vena cava. This is the coronary sinus the largest vein on the heart. And then here's the groove on the heart. This is the posterior interventricular sulcus. And uh, this is what we call the, the PIB, the posterior interventricular branch or artery. And that little vein is called the middle cardiac vein. Um, let me go to the sheep heart. All right, so here is a frontal section of the sheep heart dissection. 
Now on one of those assignments, I forget which one now, and I changed the right answer in there now, but they wanted you to label number three. So this number three right here is actually the left atrium. And whoever generated that question, they actually put right atrium in there. This is, this is the left side of the heart because when you have a frontal section, if we were looking at the half that was up here, it would be right and left. But since we're looking at this half down here, this is the left and this is the right over here. Now I know left and right by looking at the heart, sheep heart dissection when it's open, it's real easy. All you need to do is look for the thickness of the heart wall. So if you see that one side's thicker and one side is thinner, you know what side is which. The thickest side is the left side. The thinnest side is the right side. So this is all the right ventricle, left ventricle. This big bulgy thing is the left papillary muscle. This is the interventricular septum. Um, number one is pointing to the bicuspid valve. You'll always know if they want the valve or the strings, the chordae tendineae, just see where, where the pointer is pointing. If it's pointing to the little strings, they want chordae tendineae. If it's pointing to the, you know, a better place to point to would be the flap. But since it's pointing right here, I know it's, they're trying to point to the, the actual valve. That would be bicuspid valve. Um, number nine on this one is pointing to trabeculae carni right here, those rigid muscle tissue. The rigid muscle tissue in a ventricle is trabeculae carni. Here's a, a different view of, it's the same view, but a different dissection of a sheep heart. The apex is always at the bottom. The base is always at the top. The base is where all the great vessels enter and leave the heart at the base. The apex is just the point. Um, this is the left side of the heart and this is the right side of the heart. Why do I know that, Ashley? Because um, the, when you look at it, I think the um, right side is always on the opposite, right? Well, well, they could be opposite. What if I didn't say this was left already? How do you know that this is left and that's right? Um, Just by looking at it. All right, I'm gonna tell you again. It's real cool. easy. I know I'm telling. I know it's a lot of information, but here's how easy that is. You look for the thickness of this wall right here. See how that's real thick relative to that. The whole wall is thicker on this side than any any thick part on this side. So the left ventricle. This is all ventricle down at the bottom. The left ventricle has a thicker myocardium than the right ventricle has a thinner myocardium. So you always know if you're looking at the left side, if, you, if you're looking at the side that's thicker than the thinner side. The thinner side is right, the thicker side is left, right? So on this particular picture, look what, look what letter I is pointing to. You see that little flap right there? Now, the only way you would be able to know what this is, number one, is really knowing two things. That a semilunar valve separates a ventricle from its artery, and you have to know which one is on which side. So by knowing this is the left side of the heart, and thus this has to be the left ventricle, the left ventricle is separated from the aorta. This would be the aorta by the aortic semilunar valve right there. Oh, also notice the semilunar valves don't have any strings on them. No chordae tendineae. They're little bitty cups. They're called a cusp. So there's actually three of these cusps, but the other one's cut off from the other side. But this valve right here is separating the left ventricle from its artery. And I notice the left ventricle, even though I can't identify this artery, so it looks all mangled and cut. I know what artery that's supposed to be because the left ventricle 
supplies blood into the aorta. And the valve that separates the aorta from the left ventricle is a semi, the aortic semilunar valve. So that's the aortic semilunar valve right there. Now over here, A is pointing to what's above the AV valve. The chamber above the valve is always an atrium. And since this is the left side of the heart, this has to be the left, where, where the left atrium would be. Obviously it's cut, but that's where it would be. Um, then you have chordae tendony. You have C is pointing to that little bitty papillary muscle right there. So you always know where a papillary muscle's at because the little strings insert into the muscle. So all of that really is papillary muscle. So that's pointing to papillary muscle in the right ventricle. This is the right ventricular myocardium, or you could probably just put right vent. Well, no, they might want right ventricle here. They might want right myocardium here, right ventricle there inside the chamber. Um, this is the interventricular septum because it separates the muscle tissue in the heart that separates the ventricles from each other is called the septum. Interventricular means between ventricles. So this is the interventricular septum right here. And H is pointing to this chamber up here that goes back there. I know you can't hardly tell, but that's uh, the right atrium. Um, here's the external view of the sheep heart. Uh, let's start at number one. Number one is pointing externally to the left ventricle. Now I know that. I know this is the left side of the heart for this reason. Because I know I'm looking at the anterior surface of the heart. Here's how you know you're looking at the anterior surface. This little line will run from the base down towards the apex area at an angle. It's at about a 45 degree angle or so. <clears throat> That's one thing. So that is the interventricular, anterior interventricular sulcus. Right here. Runs, the anterior one runs at an angle relative to the apex. Also, this is the pulmonary trunk. You never see this from the back side of the heart like that. So whenever you see a nice smooth vessel on the front right here, you know you're, you're looking at the anterior side of the heart. So we have to determine that we're looking at the anterior side of the heart, number one, and that way we can then determine if we're looking at, if this side would be right or left, vice versa with this side. So since I know I'm looking at the anterior surface because my sulcus runs at an angle and I see the pulmonary trunk coming from the, really the anterior side of the heart, I know on either side of this sulcus are ventricles. This is the external landmark on the outside of the heart to determine where the ventricles are located without it being cut open. So just to the right of this anterior sulcus is all left ventricle. Just to the left of the sulcus is all the right ventricle. So number one is left ventricle externally. Number two is the right ventricle externally. Number three is pointing to this little flap up here. Um, I don't know what they really want for number four pointing right there. Hmm. I don't know what they were kind of getting at with that. Unless they just want atrium and then auricle, I don't know. I'm not going to look, but nonetheless, it's neither here nor there. I'm going to regrade everything anyway. But um, on the, the practical, if they have a, a pointer on the outside of the heart pointing to this thing, then you can put auricle, you have to put right or left. I know this is a left auricle because this is the left side of the heart. Or some people are going to put the left atrium. Technically, the atrium is internal. It's that hole in there, in the hole that would be here. The top of it is the auricle, if that makes any sense. And number seven is pointing to the same thing that looks like this, but you can barely see it right there. That's the right auricle over there, number seven. Um, that's the dissection. I think that's pretty much it. All right, so that should be everything labeled, and I have it on the video because I started recording again. So you can always go back and look at that, Ashley, if you need to.
Thank you so much. Okay, do you have any other questions that you want me to go over? No, that's it for right now. Thank okay. you. That's fine. All right. Well, if you need me, just email me, okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. I'll help you. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? Leslie, you have a question? Yeah. Um, are you going to upload that PowerPoint? Yes, I'm going to do it as soon as I'm done. I'm pretty much done. If y'all don't have any questions, I'm just going to close the meeting. That's it. What about Candace Stewart still here? CJ you and Renneman, do y'all have any questions? Um, yes, that PowerPoint. So it, it'll be uploaded under the heart uh, section. I'm, yeah, I'm going to put it in the link that's right below my model's book link. Okay. It'll say uh, the heart PowerPoint or something like that. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. I think it's already uploaded. I, I think it's already uploaded because I just, I was viewing yeah, I it. While, I, I thought okay. I uploaded it right before class, but I didn't see it when I was. No, you uploaded it. It's on, it's in there. If you look on your, um, it should be under the, the two. Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to go look. It, I'm going to, if it's not there, I'm going to go look at exercise two. You, you can look at exercise two under virtual learning resources and I'm going to put it there. All right, see you. Okay. All right. Okay, so if y'all don't have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting then. And if you need me, just email me. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you.